Welcome to the primer in Birdology, what we know about how bird works. This is joint work with Olga Kovaleva and Anna Rumshiski from University of Massachusetts Lowell Computer Science Department. I am Anna Rogers. I work in the University of Copenhagen in the Center for Social Data Science. So, who is BERT? BERT is a transformer-based language model which won the Best Paper Award at NACL 2019 and it is still one of the most popular transformer-based language models. It generated quite a lot of attention in the media and it also attracted a lot of attention from the researchers. Our primer in Bertology is a survey paper published in Tackle, which covers over 150 studies focusing on BERT. It is going to be tough to cover everything in 12 minutes. What I'm going to do in this talk is just give you the summary of the high-level points with maybe just uh, one or two examples per point. The takeaway number one is if you look for linguistic information in BERT, you will probably find it. For example, if you probe the masked language model component of BERT to see whether it prefers the correct verb forms to the incorrect ones, uh, such as in this example here, you will find that yes, it will prefer the correct verb form. You will find that it is possible to transform its representations in such a way that they will resemble syntactic trees. You will find that it has a lot of uh, factual and even common sense knowledge. However, the takeaway number two is that we don't know that BERT actually uses all that information that it seems to know. For example, in this sentence, the restaurant owner forgot which customer the waitress had served. The task for the language model is to fill in the gap for served. And to do that, it has to understand the roles between the customer and the waitress. <clears throat> As you can see from this table, if you remove the word customer or the word waitress or even both of them, the model performance does not necessarily degrade as much as human performance would. Even BERT seems to know a lot of information, it is not clear whether it can use it. For example, their collocation to walk into the house is a common one, so BERT knows that a person can walk into the house. but. It is obvious to a human speaker that if you can walk into the house, then the house is bigger than you. And BERT does not seem to be able to make these kind of inferences. The takeaway number three is that there are many issues with the probing paradigm. The paradigm that is used in many model analysis studies, including Bertology studies, is taking their representations and then training some probing classifier on top of those representations to see whether certain types of information can be extracted, such as part of speech information or semantic roles or syntactic uh, functions or whatnot. So it is possible to do that with BERT, but there are many questions about what such results actually tell us. As an example, consider two studies which both looked at whether BERT encodes something like hierarchical syntactic representations. On the left, you see a study which does learn some parameters for, for transforming the representations. And on the right hand, you see a figure from a study which does not. The one on the left will produce representations which look more like the syntactic trees which we know from linguistics, and the one on the right will uh, produce uh, something more coarse, but they both will do something and we do not know which one is closer to the information that BERT actually uses at inference time. Tenney and colleagues summarized this problem as follows. The fact that a linguistic pattern is not observed by our probing classifier does not guarantee that it is not there, and the observation of a pattern does not tell us how it is used. Another issue is that we may use different probing methods and they may lead to complementary or even contradictory conclusions. It may be not a great idea to rely on just a single test, which is what most of the studies have been doing so far. Another issue is how complex should a probe be allowed to be. The common wisdom is that it should be as simple as possible because if it's easy to extract, then presumably this is what the model is more likely to do. But Pimentel and colleagues argue that it can be as complex as necessary to provide the upper bound on the amount of information that can be extracted from the representation. 
Another way to look at it is how difficult is it to extract information. This is the uh, minimum description length approach of Voita and colleagues. Since we published this study, another one came out focusing specifically on the probing classifiers and all of these issues in much more detail. The fourth takeaway from Bertology is the debate on the role of attention mechanism. Intuitively, attention is very appealing as a way to encode different syntactic relations, and there are many studies which uh, consider different self-attention heads for their ability to encode different types of syntactic relations. However, it is somewhat unsettling to know that actually the same prediction can be achieved with different sets of attention weights, which do not necessarily make any sense to the human. Generally, the self-attention heads in BIRD follow one of these five types of patterns. The vertical pattern focuses predominantly on the special tokens, CLS and separator. The diagonal pattern focuses predominantly on the previous and next token. The vertical plus diagonal pattern is a combination of those two. The block pattern focuses more or less uniformly on all tokens in the sentence. And heterogeneous pattern is such a pattern in which uh, there are at least two non-special tokens which receive most of the attention, so that it could be said that this head captures some kind of relation between specifically those tokens. Now, BERT is large, the base model has uh, 144 heads, but it doesn't seem like this is large enough to be able to just capture all of the possible syntactic relations with just the self-attention. And uh, it appears that actually a lot of those 144 heads are not even doing that. So on this chart on the right, you see the ratio of uh, different types of attention patterns diagonal, vertical, heterogeneous, in samples from eight glue tasks. And the top row shows the raw attention weights, and the lower row shows the weight-normed attention patterns, which is supposed to reduce the attention to the special tokens. You see that in both cases, over uh, half of all heads is spent to encode the diagonal or the vertical plus diagonal attention pattern. Now, this is the right column. On the left, you see the proportion of the self-attention heads, which remain after importance-based pruning. So these are the heads that are supposed to do the heavy lifting for these glue tasks. And you see that actually the ratio of the potentially meaningful heterogeneous heads does not change that dramatically. So it is not the case that the heads which are the most crucial to the model performance, at least as judged by importance-based pruning, are the ones that are the most linguistically interpretable. The takeaway number five is that not all layers are created equal. BERT has uh, 12 layers in the base configuration and it seems that the middle layers are the ones that uh, will give you the best performance on the probing tasks, which seems to indicate that they are the ones that encode the more task-independent inf information and are the most transferable. The final layers at the same time are the most task-specific. You will see that after fine-tuning on most glue tasks, it is the final uh, layers, the ones the closest to the classifier, which will undergo the most changes. At least in some cases, the depth of the model matters a lot. This study finds that at least in some cases, uh, the predictions of the model change for the better as the representation travels through the layers. So the model may start with an incorrect prediction in the initial layers and uh, become better and better towards the final layers. The takeaway number six is that the bird is very over-parameterized and does not necessarily have to be that big. This is good news because the concerns about 
environmental costs of deep learning models are growing. There are many studies that show that it can be successfully compressed without sacrificing too much performance. The thing that makes all of that possible is the fact that actually out of those 12 layers and 144 heads, you can remove most of them without sacrificing much performance. This chart shows how much performance you will lose by just zeroing out individual heads and layers. And you see that in most cases uh, uh, you will not lose much performance. In some cases you will actually gain some. And uh, the same goes for layers. Takeaway number seven is that uh, there are many, many ways to improve BERT. Similarly to how we had hundreds of uh, modifications of bird 2 vec now there are many, many studies proposing different modifications to transformer-based encoders. So our survey lists uh, a number of studies which propose improvements to the training regime, to the pre-training, to the fine-tuning, to the model stability overall, and many other tweaks. The takeaway number eight is that birds should not be trusted, at least not in a single run. This table just uh, shows the results from bird fine-tuning on four glue tasks from three different studies. And you see that simply by varying uh, the fine-tuning initialization, it is possible to get up to 7% improvement over the original reports. And in MRPC, they actually even uh, got better results than some of the later models, such as Exonet and Roberta. So just the lucky random seed uh, may actually make so much difference that the model will not just perform better on uh, a given test set, it will generalize better. So this chart, the bottom row shows how well BERT generalizes when trained on MNLI to an adversarial dataset, Hans. On the y-axis you see the number of instances of fine-tuned BERT out of 100, and uh, on the x-axis you see uh, the performance that they got. Especially on the lexical overlap heuristic, the bottom left corner, the instances of BERT vary a lot in their generalization capacity, and uh, some of them are actually doing pretty well. And uh, this happens for no reason other than just different fine-tuning initialization. The takeaway number nine is that uh, BERT works too well and it is suspicious. Maybe it is not so much about BERT, but about our benchmarks. To begin with, let's consider the fact that on some glue tasks, in particular on SST2, you will get 80% accuracy without any pre-training whatsoever. And of course, the results with pre-training are better, but this raises questions about how much knowledge from pre-training is actually necessary to do that task. It appears that BERT learns shallow heuristics in NLI datasets, it learns shallow heuristics and reading comprehension datasets, and it probably learns shallow heuristics and everything else. We really have no reason to expect anything else. If uh, the dataset has uh, some kind of spurious pattern, which is really obvious and has a strong correlation with the predicted label, then we have no reason to expect that BERT or any other deep learning model would not learn it. So these are the biggest takeaways from our primer in Bertology. And among the unresolved questions, I would point to these. The first one is how to create better training data, how to try to avoid teaching the artifacts. If we know that the word never is systematically associated with the contradiction label in NLI, then BERT does not need to do anything else. But that task is very difficult. It is hard to create a bias-free dataset. We also need to think about uh, how to try to find better ways to train our models, because probably there will always be at least some kind of undesirable signal. And finally, because both of these first 
points are difficult, we also need to come up with better benchmarks so as to be able to tell whether the model has learned those undesirable artifacts anyway or not. Finally, all the probing studies have so far not told us what actually happens at inference time. Some of the directions uh, for that have been amnesiac probing, so to make model forget something and then see how it does on a certain task. Then pruning the model down to components which seem to perform a certain function, but neither of these are the silver bullet. Hopefully more uh, convincing approaches will be found in the future. Thank you for your attention. If you would like a copy of these slides, they can be found on this page.